if you noticed in verse 3, the narrator said, Ruth happened to glean in the part of the field that Boaz owned. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk to you this morning about the subject, nothing just happens. Come on, man. Nothing Come on. just happens. Come on. See, the book of Ruth is a romantic love story, and in any story, we have characters. Right. Right. We have what's called a cast of characters. The characters are Eliminac, Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons, Malon and Chilion. Ruth, Ophrah, Ophrah, and Myra, and then Boaz. So we also have a time and a place. The time that was back in the time when the judges ruled. And it was in the place of Bethlehem and Moab. Right, right. And Moab, you know, y'all remember that name. That was, Moab was Lot's son mm -hmm. that he had mm -hmm. by his oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. Lot had a daughter, a son by his oldest daughter. Yeah. The country of Moab was about 50 miles from Bethlehem. That's not really significant, but 50 miles may not seem like a, a long ways from a city. Baron, we have automobiles and airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, we can go 50 miles in half an hour. Yeah, yeah. Some of y'all, it takes me an hour to get there. <laughs> but let's put a, t a pin in that time, and I'll go back and uh, clear that up a little later, why it's important that the narrator stated that it happened during the time of the judges, sure. yeah. Yeah. when the judges ruled. See, um, in the period of the judges, Imelech, Naomi, and their sons leave Bethlehem because of a famine in the land. They went to stay in the land of Moab. Moab was not one of Israel's friendly neighbors. And let's, Bethlehem, that name means house of bread. And they went from the house of bread because of a fam famine in the land right, right. to go to a place that really wasn't friendly to them. But while they were staying in Moab, Imelech, Elimelech dies, leaving Ruth with her two sons. Her two sons took up Moabite wives. It was, there's nothing in the Bible that really says that they couldn't do that, but they did. And there was, they were married foreigners, foreigners, and they were supposed to marry people within their own clan. Milion took a wife. Her name was Ruth. Chilion, the other son, married Ophrah. So, you know, we're getting the characters now uh, coming together. Now, Naomi had heard that the famine was over in Israel. We don't know who told her. Well, how she found out that the famine was over in Israel. But as she prepared to go back to Bethlehem, her hometown, she tried to persuade her daughter-in-laws right. right. to stay right. in Moab. Right. And there's a reason for that, because Naomi was getting up there in age. Right. She didn't have any kids, another right. son that right. either one of them could marry. Right. So she felt that if you stay with your mama and your daddy, then you'll have somebody that can support you. Right, right. Oprah, Ruth, they resisted. Now, all this is in chapter one, right. a little background of what happens. Yeah, yeah. So Mo, Ruth and 
Oprah resisted. But Naomi insisted. And so Oprah said, okay, I see what you're talking about. I see your point. So she went back and she stayed in Moab with her family. Now Ruth was a little different. See, that's why it's known as one of those love stories. Ruth decided, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay with you. Wherever you go, I'll go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. So Naomi couldn't get rid of Ruth. So they get back to um, Bethlehem. Everybody in the city was happy to see them. They were greeting Mm -hmm. Naomi. He just happened to say, hey, Naomi, hey, Naomi. But if y'all notice, I said another one of those characters was Myra. And Naomi felt that God had somehow um, left her, somehow that he was mean to her because of her husband dying and her two sons. Left her without anybody to take care of them. So she told the people, hey, my name is Myra. I left here yeah. as Ruth, which is a pleasant person and a lovely person. That's what that name uh, I mean. I left here as Naomi, right. and that was a, her name meant being pleasant or right. lovely. Right. But now she's returning home, and she is bitter. Yes. She changed her name to Myra. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes that happens to us. Come on, bro. Come on. You know, have you ever felt like God? Did not take care of you yeah, like yeah. you know he can. Yeah, yeah. He did not do the things that you thought yeah. he should do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He let you get in a situation that you weren't too happy about. Yeah, yeah. And you were bitter, yeah, yeah. upset, yeah. Uh-huh. mad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They would say, how can you be mad at God? God is God. But if we go back in the Old Testament, we had Moses was angry. Yes. Yes. And because of his anger... He wasn't able to go in the promised land. So it's okay for a little while. You can't stay mad at God forever because God will always come through for you. He may not come through when you want him, but he's always in time. Now, remember, Naomi and Ruth were ladies. And... They lived in a time where there were no good jobs for females, no good paying jobs. They lived in a male-dominated society. Mm -hmm. And see, they were faced with several issues as they came back to Bethlehem. They were Mm -hmm. poverty-stricken. They were both widows without a son who could secure employment and provide for them. Naomi was possibly too old, too sick, especially if she had to do any kind of work, Mm -hmm. any hard work, Mm -hmm. gleaning in the fields. Now, Ruth was a foreigner, a Moabite, who was to be carefully watched. Yes. You know, sometimes I find myself, and you may have also found yourself in those shoes. Just think about it. if you or I decided to get our 10,000 steps in Holland Park at night. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come on, brother. Now, if y'all don't know where Holland Park is and never heard of it, you know, it's on the good side of town. <laughs> That's where uh, Jerry Jones lives in Holland Park. You know, George W. Bush, our former president, lives in Holland Park. So you have to have a little money to live in Holland Park because you can't buy a house in Holland Park for under $850,000. I know this because I am a realtor. (laughs) So what I'm saying is people watch you when you are different. They look at you just because you're different. Now, I know there are some of us that live in Holland Park, 
And I do know that there are some of us that live in affluent neighborhoods all over the country. Uh, take, for instance, uh, Gates. Y'all may remember a couple of years ago, he got arrested because he had left his keys and couldn't get in his house, so he was trying to get mm -hmm. through a window. Somebody called the police on him. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe he lived there. You can't live here. So they arrested him and took him to jail for trying to get on his, in his own house because he didn't look like most of the people that lived around him. You get the picture? Yeah. Despite the minor amount of problems confronting Ruth and Naomi, Ruth was proactive. See, there are three lessons that we can learn from the book of Ruth. Ruth took the initiative. She knew they didn't have any food. So she went to Naomi and said, Naomi, let me go out into the fields and yeah. glean. Verse two, yeah. verse two. Yeah. I'm getting my first lesson out of verse two. We're going to put a pen in verse one and come back to it. Now, the first lesson that we should learn from Ruth is that we must take the initiative. We must take the initiative. See, Ruth was a foreigner, and she didn't let that stop her from going out in the fields to glean. Right, right. Now, let me define gleaning for you. If gleaning is when you go out in a field that you don't own, mm -hmm. and you get behind the reapers. The reapers are the ones that's, let's see, if we were in a cotton field, that's more close to home, or a corn field, and you were, had people picking your corn. They don't have to do that now. They got machines that do that. But back when I was growing up, you had to pick the cotton. You had to get the ears of corn off the stalks. So to paint a picture of this, Ruth is out in somebody else's field right. picking up food so that she and Naomi yeah. would have food on a table. Now, you might say that's, you know, that's not really a big deal, but it is for a woman, a foreigner, yes. yeah. going out into the field. See, there was dangers, yes. things yeah. that Ruth yeah. faced. Yes. Ruth could have been attacked by the reapers. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. She could have been molested by the reapers. Yep. Yep. But she wasn't. And see, back in verse 2, Naomi, she told Naomi that she would find favor mm -hmm. in his eyes. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, she had the faith to know that when she went out to work, to glean, that whosoever field she was in, uh -huh. she would find favor uh -huh. yeah. in that person. Yeah. 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 And she said in him, because back in those days, women didn't own property. But anyway, Ruth, by taking the initiative, God had already provided for her. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, God knows mm -hmm. what's, what you need. He knows when you need it. Yes. So go with me. Now, I'll read it. Leviticus 19, verses 9. And 10. You might want to write that down so you can check it out later. Just make sure that I'm not feeding y'all anything that's not in the Bible. Right, right, right. And verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your fields right up to its ed edges. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And all shall not strip your vineyards. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor yes. and for the sonyurns. I am the Lord 
your God. Yeah, yeah. God made a provision yeah, he did. Yeah. for the poor, yes. yeah. for the widows, yeah. for people that may were just passing through yes. so that they could have food. Yeah. God made that provision. Yeah. He also stated again in Deuteronomy. Chapter 24, verse 16. Right. When you reap your harvest in your fields and forget a shift in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sonors, the fatherless, the widows, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. See, what... I want y'all to get out of this is that by Ruth taking the initiative if she had not on, got up and went out into the field to glean yeah. she wouldn't have received yes. wow. that blessing Come on, Come on. Come on. see Ruth knew that nobody was going to drop a Mickey D sandwich on their table <laughs> Ruth knew that they were hungry. Yes. She didn't wait for Naomi to say, hey, we, right. uh, we need food. I'm going to go out and get it. Yeah. Yeah. Naomi talking to Ruth. Mm -hmm. See, Ruth didn't wait for Naomi right. to say that. Right. Ruth got up on her own accord yes. and went out to provide for them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lesson number two. Ruth knew that she, you must work to take care of your needs. You must work to take care of your needs. See, if you are physically able and mentally able to work, then there's no reason for you to sit at home and, and say, oh, woe well, is with me. Because you should get up yes. and find something. Yes. It may not be what you want. Come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. Ruth didn't want to go out and glean in those fields, but she did what she had to do. Yes. Yes. So what I'm saying is you may know somebody or somebody in here may be unemployed. Get up. Go look for a job. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You may not find what you want right then. But God is making a provision for you yes, sir. Yes. because God works for his people yes. behind the scenes yes. when you don't even know yes, sir. Yes, sir. that he's working for you. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So if you are physically, mentally yeah. able to yeah. work, yeah. get up and go. Yeah. See, I know some of you have been unemployed. I'm not going to call any names, but we're working now. <laughs> Got a good job. Yes. Yes. But we did what we had to do right. in order to survive yes. before that good job yes. come along. Yes. Right. See, you may go all your life preparing for a certain type of work. Wow. I want to be a doctor. Wow. I want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But you're not working. You got a four-year college degree. You're not working. The job is not going to come to you. You need to go to the job. Yeah. And if you are offered a job that you may not like, take that job until you get the job that you want. You may not know this, but it's easier to find a job when you're already working. It's easier. That job's not going to come to you, but if you are in need, you need to get up and work. Right. Now, I don't know if y'all realize the type of work that Ruth was doing. Imagine being out in the hot sun all day with people you don't know. Looking over your shoulders to see if someone is going to attack you. Looking over your shoulders to see if somebody is going to molest you. But she went anyway. And gleaning is hard work. Yeah. Now, 
Also, back in verse 2, Ruth told Naomi she would find favor in his eyes. Ruth didn't know who field she was going to glean in. But she went. Now y'all follow me to verse 3. <laughs> verse 3. Now I told her, go my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field <laughs> that belonged mm -hmm. to Boaz. And again, the title of my subject, or the subject of my title, sermon. whatever, my sermon, <laughs> is nothing just yeah. happens. Yeah. And that's the way the narrator stated it. Yes. Nothing just happened. But by Ruth taking the initiative to get up and go work, she found that she would find favor in Boaz's field. She didn't know she was in Boaz's field. But see, that was one of those things where God is working behind the scene to help you get what you need. Now, see, the work that Ruth was doing, it supplied their needs for right now. But later on in the story, you're going to find that God supplied something else for Ruth and Naomi. But I don't want to build, yes, give, give, give y'all a spoiler there. You got to read the whole book. It's yeah. not that big. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Not that many words. Take you about an hour to read it. But let's go back to verse 1. You know, I told y'all to put a pen in that. In verse 3, the author mentions Boaz's name. In verse one, we find out that Boaz is a relative of Elimelech right. uh -huh. right. and of the clan of Elimelech. Right. Yeah. Now, see, back in those days, if a widow had no sons, mm -hmm. the nearest of kin yeah. right. could marry that right. person, yeah. provide for that person, yeah. And they were, the kids would still inherit right. what their father had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know y'all are keeping up with what's going on in today's world. We're talking women about getting equal pay for an equal job. Isn't it strange that they had to have heirs in order for them to inherit mm -hmm. the land, mm -hmm. or inherit what their fathers had? Mm -hmm. Equal pay, equal opportunity. It didn't start with us today. It was back, way back then. Now again, in lesson two, we know that Ruth had to get up and work. And I'm at my verse three. Nothing just happens. See, it just didn't happen that Ruth was in the field of Boaz. Verse one states that Boaz was an upstanding young man. Yep. Well, an outstanding man. It didn't yep. say young man. Boaz was wealthy. Yep. Yep. What woman in here that's single wouldn't want an outstanding well. man <laughs> that's wealthy? <laughs> I know if I was a woman, I, that's what, who I'd want, you know. I ain't got to work. But, you know, we need, God is supplying that need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Naomi and Ruth needed a provider. God put her in the right place at the right time for the right reason to get her a provider. Now, let me talk about some real people, some people that I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come on. See, I, I have a, a friend that, you know, she told me one day that 
she didn't have the means to put gas in her vehicle. You know, it was just that tight. And she, and this is a real person. And she uh, was going to help somebody else. You know, I won't say what she was going to help him for, but the point is, she had a car, a vehicle that was running on fumes. Y'all know what I mean when I say running on fumes. And it was a rainy day, pouring down rain. So she get in her vehicle, go to help a person. And have y'all ever driven down and let better? One side and the other side. Let better is, I think, three or four lanes. Now, it's raining. She's going one direction. And she looks out on the other side of the street, and she sees a ball of green paper just balled up in the rain. Wow. <laughs> she immediately made a U-turn. You know, she's a good citizen. The street should be clean. But when she got to that ball of green paper that was balled up, now I don't know how you could look across Ledbetter in the rain and see a balled up green lump in the rain. But by her making that decision to make that U-turn and pick that ball up, she had $65. This is a true story. She's sitting in here today. I won't call her name. I also have eight brothers. One of my brothers, <laughs> the particular Jan January two, 2017, you know, this brother of mine, he mows yards, you know, for, you know, to supplement his income. Mm -hmm. He gets a good income, but things just didn't line up right. <laughs> a little short that month. But God was working behind the scenes way back in 1996. He paid off a car in 1996. Got up one morning, went to his mailbox, and there was an envelope in there, you know, with that little window in it and stuff, and it's green, looked like a check, but y'all know sometimes they be trying to trick you <laughs> with that look-alike check. No, especially bills. When you owe a bill, they'll send you a look-alike check in a minute. But I'm going to tell you, what was in that envelope was a check for $750 for a car that he paid off in 1996. See, God knew back in 1996 that my brother would need some help in January 2017. Was that 21 years? God knows everything. And that was not the end of the story. A couple of weeks later, went out and got one of them funny looking letters. There was another check in his mailbox for almost a thousand dollars. He paid he traded his vehicle in. They charged him too much when he paid it off. That's what they owed him. I'm not going to call my brother's name, but y'all all know him. <laughs> See, God works behind the scenes when you don't even know it. What I'm saying is nothing just happened. I remember a 19, no, let's go back further than that. A 12-year-old boy that had moved from a little city of Ferris, Texas, and while he was living in Ferris, Texas, he liked having his own money. He liked to be able to go to the store and get him some hot links and a soda or whatever. And, you know, back in 1967, you know, he mowed yards for a dollar twenty-five per yard. That's the back end front. <laughs> but the point is, he liked having his money. He didn't want to ask daddy or mama, can you give me a quarter or whatever. He wanted more than a quarter. Now, if y'all haven't figured that out, I'm talking about myself right now. 
But when we moved to the big city of Dallas, I went knocking on doors trying to find me some yards to cut or some bottles to pick up. See, when he lived in Ferris or when I lived in Ferris, we lived down the street from a little place called the Clipso Inn. And people would just throw their soda bottles out. And back then, you could take the soda water bottle back to the store, three cents for 16 ounce, no, for 12 ounce, a nickel for a 16 ounce, and you got a whole quarter for a quart. So, you know, he was used to making money. I must go back to he. But when we moved to Dallas, I didn't have that luxury of mowing yards because every door I knocked on said, baby, we got somebody already that's mowing our yards. I got a little discouraged. But one day, my mama sent me to the store to get some milk, make some bread. See, we didn't buy like mama made biscuits, whole cakes, and cornbread. So I was going to get a can of milk. It was hot and muggy, and I do not like the heat. I didn't want to go to the store. But being the obedient son that I was, I went to the store. But on my way walking to the store, this lady pulls up to me and says, hey, little boy, you want a job? You know what I said? Yes. <laughs> so she said, let's check with your mom first to see if it's OK. So Miss Johnny comes over to the house. She asked my mama. Mama said, yes. <laughs> that was my first real job. And some of y'all, you know, I think I made a dollar twenty-five per hour wow. washing dishes. But I was happy. Yeah. I had my own money. Yeah. Got paid every two weeks. I worked so many hours doing some of that. I cleared $165 off a dollar twenty-five. So I'm telling you, it was. <laughs> I was young. That's also where I learned how to cook. Miss Johnny was the cook. And she taught me some things about cooking. Hmm. See, what I'm saying is, I like having my own money. I wanted to work. But if I had not gone to the store for my mama and that high son, I wouldn't have been able to receive what God had placed in place for me. Nothing just happens. I can remember a 19-year-old teenager. He was in the Marine Corps. I'm talking about me again. But to show you that nothing just happens. I was in San Diego, California, the West Coast. When I got out of boot camp, I stopped off for 10 days at home, and then I went to the East Coast. I went from the West Coast to the East Coast. And the East Coast, I didn't know anybody. Transferring into a new base, didn't know anybody. But I had made an acquaintance with a guy named Jeff Harris. Jeff didn't have a car. I had a car. See, God provided me with a car because, see, I always work. From the day I got that first job, I never stopped working until today. But anyway, Jeff didn't have a car. Jeff met this young lady in Savannah, Georgia. They were dating. You know, we, I was 19, Jeff about 22. And I was carrying Jeff down there every weekend, staying in a motel while he take my car out and entertain his girlfriend. By the way, they got married later on. But I told Jeff, I said, hey, man, I, I can't be driving you down here every weekend. You're going to have to catch the bus. Or your friend going to have to have a friend for me. <laughs> See, they set up a blind date for me. A person that I never met, never knew, 
But I can tell y'all, when she walked in the door over to Barbara's house, I just looked at her and I said, that's who I'm going to marry. And 42 plus years later, that blind date is still with me as my wife. See, what I want y'all to understand, nothing just happened. You see, if God would take care of a foreigner, which I might say a Gentile, don't you know that he'll do more yes, of the same for you yes, yeah. that believe in him? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God will take care of yes, you. Yes, He's been working behind the yes, scenes for you to supply yes, your sir. needs yes, sir. before you were even born. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. I want y'all to take this away with you. Nothing just happens. 